What do I want people to take from it? I don't know. I've never known. The feeling that, yes, all this shit we've been told to like, we don't really like it because we really like this. It's a no-brainer when someone hits you like that, isn't it? Somehow it's, it's actually come out sounding really commercial anyway. I don't think it's commercial, man. It is, I, I think, don't fucking know. I think they can handle it. That's I think it's saying. fucking proper See. music, and I think it's I think it's a classic record. I wouldn't say it's commercial it. in the same way that, like, you know, paid back writers commercial or, or oh, like, yeah, you know, oh, strawberry yeah, fields yeah, or okay, like, you know. Okay. Dave came all the way to London, right, initially, to have this meeting with us, right, about this concept of this album that we were going to make. The original conversation was, yeah, one guitar at a time. It was a, it was a pretty inspiring meeting, I've got to say, you know, it was like, right, we're going to strip the sound back, right? And what we're going to do is, you know, there's going to be no fat on the album, there's going to be no notes are going to be wasted, it's just the bare minimum. You know, we kind of, in spirit, we kept to that. So we got on there, you know, and the first thing it's like, let's put another guitar on it, way, bring the fucking tuba, you know. And the next thing, I remember sat at the mixing desk going, fucking brilliant idea, you're stripping this sound back, and he was going, oh, fuck off. It's really great that we met him and we got on with him so well, because before that, we kind of, we'd always done it ourselves. And at the end of, Ethan Chemistry, I'd kind of hit a wall with it and I was like, you know what, I just can't be bothered with this anymore. I need somebody else to do it because, you know, I can only get it to sound one way. You work with people who work with shitloads of other bands, they have more ideas. Well, Dave's huge talent is mixing and in also getting, um, you know, good performances out of us uh, in the studio. Uh, give, give me a one or two more of those so we, then we can double it either way, you know? All right. Here we go. But not in terms of taking control. The best thing is that you don't really know who's directing it, but it all just seems to unfold. I wrote those lyrics, I got I was fucking arsehole writing that. And you can tell it's just nonsense. But it's like, that's the way that I used to write when I used to write Supersonic and some might say and all that. When Dave heard this demo, it's very sparse, done it in Gem's Loft. And we rushed it, and because he was going, oh, I really like the way that it's really loose and it's dead sparse. And me and Gem looked at each other, and we were like, well, the reason it's like that is Gem's kids were coming in from school at fucking 10 past five, and we had to fuck off and just leave it without edit, without, there's only one guitar, and he was going, oh, so it's not delivery. We were like, I don't know if his kids weren't coming home, we'd still be there doing it now. No one coming around the house, you know, he's kind of, we start at midday, and he's got to be out by the time the kids get home. So it's great, no messing about. In the demo on the back, you can hear somebody hoovering up. The bit on the end of the bag it up, you know, the explosion, that's uh, plastic explosives fit, uh, recorded from 100 metres, right? And this CD has them recorded from a distance going right up, so it's just like... Fucking. I would use sound effects CDs on everything. Seriously. He was playing back the mix and put the explosion in before Gem had heard it, and he was good, <laughs> and he went... Oh, fucking hell, I'm not sure about that. That's an explosion, man, that's the start of the album, that's pyrotechnics. Well, it's not about the fucking explosion, it's like, oh, right, yeah, but the gong's all right, isn't it? It's quite an odd tune, that. It's not like anything I've ever written before, and the bass drops in and out, and it's very strange chords, and it's a bit Pink Floyd, and once that finishes, the rest of the album just really flows. Our music has changed, without a doubt. We've changed, I think, but in the right way. There's a line, and we've not gone over it. The last time we went to Abbey Road, we got kicked out, you know, because it was in 97 doing b and we were all a bit mad then. Uh, so it's nice to finally do a full album there. I know what to do in the boardwalk, under the boardwalk, where we first rehearsed in Manchester, because the, the stars were in the lines, but I said, fuck that, man, let's do it in Abbey Road. Eyes over the city, rise up from your soul. I mean, ordinarily we would have gone to LA to do it, because it cost us a fucking fortune. <laughs> Seriously, it's two grand a fucking day. The best studio in LA is $2,000 a day. 
as the uh, dollar to pound ratio goes, that's half price to me. It's round the corner for the start, and the Beatles obviously did all their stuff, and we're Beatleheads. You kind of walk over the zebra crossing every morning, dodging Spanish tourists. I actually got asked, <laughs> excuse me, can we just get a picture? I'm like, well, go on then. And then they handed me the camera. I was like, I want me to take a picture. All right, fair enough. So come on. Be odd flashes where you just go, oh fucking hell, you know, this is it. We're not like doing a session, we're doing like our own record, you know. It's just a great place to go and work, and especially being Beatles fans and stuff like that. It is a special room, I don't care what anybody says, there's magic there, absolutely, you know. And I don't know whether you raise your game as well, the control room is that small, everybody just sits around on the studio floor. So somebody might be doing their, you know, piano overdub, it's very involved, it's good. You know, to other people it might freak them out, but it didn't freak us out. I had the recording time of my life, every day. When we put all our gear in there, we made that big room and it was a small room. So a lot of people come in there and go, fuck, what are you calling it? Oh, this is too fucking big. I'm going, we go and have a look in it with all our gear in there and you won't think it's big now. I mean, we brought half a million quids worth of our own recording equipment in there because the, the stuff that they had back in the day is all gone. So they've got these uh, modern desks and they're fucking horrible, but they've still got all the old mics. You go in a, like a run-of-the-mill studio and they won't have that many, but with Abbey Road, you just find the one that suits the tone of your voice and they do whatever they do up there. I don't know how it goes on. As long as I can sing to it and it sounds good in the headphones, I'd rather just wait for the magic to happen. We decided we were going to get the 50-piece choir to sing on these tracks. And they're only due to sing on three. And what are the two that they sang on? That's right, the ones that you'll never fucking hear. And they were singing these songs and it was like, exceptional recorders and brilliant and they're, they're you know, they're, well they've got 50 piece choir on, it doesn't get any better than that, you know, you sing fucking Umpty Dumpty and it'd sound uplifting. You can vaguely hear them on the turn and yeah, I say to Dave, just fucking turn them up. You know, and he's going, oh, to dominate the track. He's going, that was the idea, you know, there is 50 of them. The bit after the turning was written the night before, the very, very, very last day of mixing. And I was sat in the hotel room, just finding about playing the guitar, and started playing that bit, and I was like, wow, that sounds brilliant, coming off the end of that. Uh, gave the guitar to Andy, said, you've got the finger-picking style, sat him outside on a stool in LA, and that's the traffic going past. There is a tune that only me is on. Which one's that? The little weirdy tune. Is that, oh, it's just you. It's yeah, just see, me, man. Back, see, oh, I'm sitting oh, in reception of the studio. Do about five takes because every five minutes the reception was going, "Hello, the village." Order of donuts from Mr. Sorry. Hey, the village. Hello, <laughs> the village people. It's all got a roll, and you know, even the gaps are important. But I don't know if people listen like that anymore. I know I do. I don't think we'd ever be the kind of band who go, "Oh, we're only ever going to do tracks." <laughs> the rapture it's um it's kind of proper skeletal modern blues i suppose that started off as like a real floaty kind of john lennon thing i think i was listening to something by the doors the night before and you know lights going in the air and go fucking hell that would be great Going in to make Don't Believe the Truth, we had about 70 songs or something for that that were all pretty good. Noel pulled out 11. Our plan was, well, we're going to we'll just pull out 15 others. We kind of set out to make this album that was the songs that were left over because we'd written so many songs for Don't Believe the Truth. We kind of pretty much had it all done before we went in. And then we got in there, it kind of changed shape twice during the recording. For the first time since Definitely Maybe, I started to write in the studio. The three songs that I wrote ended up being brilliant, and we still left two songs behind. With the arrival of a new child, I became extremely focused on my work. You just kind of get it down while you're, while you're hot, as they say. We all write separately, nobody kind of, we don't sit and collaborate. I, I couldn't do that, it's just too stressful for me. 
I kind of just write at home in the, in the quiet hours and I'm just writing songs like I've never written before. I can't, I can't, I don't seem to be able to stop. I'm in the studio as we speak. He's addicted to it. He loves it. He loves it. He's got demo haters. This album, unlike the others, Noel was coming in the night before and demoing stuff that we'll be doing the next day. So I hadn't even heard it. There was three. One of them was Falling Down and then Come On It's All Right, which is, hasn't made it. And then Shock of the Lightning. <laughs> The single is one of the ones that I wrote in the studio and we were in there one night and it was quite late and we'd finished a track before we'd started the next one I said oh I've got I've just got a couple of ideas just like strum down on acoustic guitar and I'll do I kind of put drums and bass on them so you're working out the tempos and the key and everything you get on the drums play the drums get on the bass play the bass do the guitar give me some headphones sing it down and you're kind of seeing it evolve over 10 minutes it was really out of the ordinary for us to do that. Normally, we'll know a song inside out by the time we record it. That's what fucking See, making records is that's about. That's the first I think. time that's happened since I've been in the band. I'd only written them the night before, and within you know a week they were fully formed and recorded. It's like, fucking hell, man, that's the way to do it. You know what I mean? It's brilliant, really interesting. That's the magic of being a songwriter, really, without sounding too corny. I mean, Noel's a great songwriter. We all know he can do it. And then to have a week where you just get hit with three new ones on the trot, that's, that's when it just goes, wow, it is a bit like magic, isn't it? We're punk rock, man, I think, when we get cracking on it. Some days we spend a lot of time on the melody and like, we should be just fucking levelling the fuck out of it. That actually started off as a really gentle strum on the guitar. Kind of quite folky and then I must have got pissed off at summit and fucking started furiously bashing away like a madman. When he did the drum solo, and my immediate reaction was, well that's ridiculous, that's never going to get used, and of course, great, we used it. Fucking hell, he sweated that day, let me tell you. Well, the last thing we've done that was in any way approaching that kind of ferocity was bring it on down, I guess. And I love singing songs like that, because you just, you're not really singing them, you're just fucking flying, you know what I mean? You're just, you're just like, bouncing on a wave. It was kind of getting faster and faster, and it got to the point where it's really fast, the version that you hear now. I turned to Dave and said, that sounds like the way to come back. I think I'm out of time, it always gets me. I mean, that's soul music for me. He's got his own style. Lots of la-la-las, lots of strange kind of inversions of chords and uh, really instinctive, quite strange arrangements. He's just got something special. Beyond Goosebumps. That took me like fucking nine years tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I only, only finished that last week, I started, I started that when fucking started that and bring it on down, come out. <laughs> Definitely made it. Started that after the boardwalk. Complete and utter classic. Great vocals. Like when the solo even kicks in, it just sings. It just says what it says, I mean. I didn't write, I didn't go to write a song like that. It just sort of just happened, you know what I mean? It's a bit of a sad song, isn't it, I suppose? He's trying to say things that he would never say. I mean, we are Northern, after all. He's got no idea how good he is. He just does these things, and if someone, if someone makes a comment about that's a good song, he just, he's just like, what do you mean? What I'm trying to say is he's modest in his songs. He, he won't ever push them forward too much, but he's a quality songwriter. I think the album needs that kind of song because initially 
there was a running order without it on and it was just too intense. You've had like about four or five tunes that were all pretty mad and full on and then suddenly out of time comes on and it just goes. <sighs> I find it hard with words other than that. If I, if I found it easier with words, I'd be fucking huge. I would, I'd be massive. I'd be like, I'd be like fucking bigger than WH Smith. I remember Liam saying about, I've got Ian Lennon speaking on this. Me and Gem just sat there, and we were going, fucking, well, I, I fancy a bit of Lennon on this, you know what I mean? And I think, okay, what's that mean then? Gem went through a lot of old, Lennon radio things and pull that one out. And that actual sample, I remember taping it off the radio in 1980 and it's on a cassette and me and Liam flicked through it on a Curry's cassette. Churchill said it's every Englishman's inalienable right to live where the hell he wants. It's John Lennon trying to defend moving to New York. I was just like, turn it up, you can't, all you can hear is... I tell you something, first one, first one. Is it John Lennon or is it Winston Churchill? I don't know. Get off your high horse, lady. I don't need a ride tonight. Yeah, Abbey Road was set up like a real playground. I mean, we have amassed a big collection of musical instruments over the years. It's great, because they were all selfing already to go at the same time, so it was quite exciting to record like that. We had them displayed in Abbey Road really nicely for photographs, really. For example, there's about a million keyboards. You line up all the keyboards and you go, hang on, we're not even meant to be a keyboard band. And then Herbie Hancock popped his head in and he was going, hey man, I've never seen one of these. I've never heard of that. And we're going with your king keyboard, you know. This was a meeting of the minds. Liam and Herbie Hancock, the greatest jazz pianist in the history of music. Meets our kid. So I walk in with him and he's going, hey, it's sweaty. And I said, uh, it's my brother Liam. Hey Liam, how's it going? And he's like, all right, I went, Herbie Hancock. And Liam goes, all right. And I went, you know, da 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 Oh yeah, fucking geezer, man, geezer. I always love little bits on albums that you don't know really what's coming. You know the, the bit where the guy's walking up the beach, crunching away? To me, there's all the Quadrophenia references, but as well it could be Get Carter. It's quite psychedelic and Pink Floyd is. What it's got to do with the fucking song, I don't I mean, And it was my idea. Love that. That's, I just get Quadrophenia for that one. The best bit that is. And they milk it for about 30 seconds. I just think it's such a British sound. No one's ever going to notice this, but the seagull sounds start going backwards and then Falling Down comes in. There's the bleepy synths start coming in for that. That's my favourite bit of the album. Falling Down in particular had to be sang like somebody was singing it lost in outer space kind of thing. And um, Liam's not kind of a lost in outer space kind of geezer. I just try to get the delivery right. Liam's got a better voice than me when he sings my songs, but it's like if I tried to sing one of Liam's songs, he'd just go, well, you're not singing it right because it's, it's more about the delivery than the musical notes. We can both hit the notes, but it's about the delivery. He has a wider range than Liam. You know, it's kind of, it's a different plan of attack. But like, say for instance, falling down, that is just no all over really, you know. challenge myself in any any aspect of my life you know why do that why make it hard on yourself fucking hell man do you know what i mean you know i really try to take myself out of my comfort zone why why do you do why do people do that you know get your comfort zone stay in it that's what it's there for you know i didn't tell all these records to fucking then go but yeah the, the, today i will mostly be singing on one leg you know with one ear gaffer taped over just to see how that that's bullshit man no i never challenge myself i do the bare minimum I think Falling Down is one of Noel's greatest songs and um, and I love that feel of it, you know. It's from the greatest film you've never seen yet. Is that all that I've ever known? I mean, Wella walked in one day, 
Actually, I didn't see him come in. I was playing some guitar on one of Liam's tracks. And I got to the last note. It's dead quiet. And I just hear in my headphones, the mic come on and fucking someone go, fucking rubbish. And I was like, is that Weller? And he was like, fucking rubbish. And then his own fashion kind of walked in and he went, you got enough fucking guitars or what? I was like, we've got 90 odd guitars, you know, all the same, all the same model. But well, he, he only lives around the corner, you see, so. But we didn't get him to play on anything. There was lots of guest appearances from Kasabian. They didn't get the red light, I'm afraid. One night we were there towards the end and Serge, Tom and Dibs come down. Someone said, let's all jam. Well, it weren't fucking anyone from Manchester. Yeah, or Oxford. We get it in our heads that we're going to just put all the mics up and we're going to record just whatever happened and we're going to kind of put it in between songs on the album. I'm playing drums, Zach's on another drum kit, Dibs is playing the bass, Serge is playing guitar, Gem is playing guitar, Liam and Tom around <laughs> this one mic. I was like, let's just play one note, right? Well, it was the shittest note of all time. <laughs> playing one chord. Serge looked like he was on stage at Wembley. He was jumping around like a fucking madman going, I've waited my whole life for this. Tom is doing amateur aerobics by this mic. I was just glad I was behind the drum kit just fucking bashing away. It's fantastic, man, you know, just them coming down and hanging out really, you know, and it's, that's how it should be. It's how I, I always thought it was gonna be like when I was 10. I've got a, a CD of it, I kid you not. It is fucking appalling. a bit of a pun in a way. Beware there's life, you know, and you can take it how you want it. The bass and the sitar, and there's no guitars on it, they weren't allowed to see if we could get away with it. I mean, there's only two chords in it. Had a bit of Manny in my head, obviously a bit of McCartney. I had me banging this gong, and I wouldn't mind, but the mallet weighs about fucking 10 pounds. Noel played sitar on it and Andy played sitar on it. You know it's not a real one, it's a toy electric one. They're little plastic ones, right? And they're shaped like a sitar. They've got a speaker on the front. They're like the little square radios, but then I was in a shop and saw an actual one shaped like a, a sitar with little fake strings that you could just pluck. I just switch it on and you pick the key and you leave it there, right? And we had it in the, the Beatles echo chamber, which is like this tiled room where they got all the reverbs. It looked hilarious, as in this like really famous room. It's this little tiny plastic sitar with this massive mic that's worth about 50 grand shoved in front of it. And the sitar's worth about £12.50. I was in there for hours just going, wow, wow, wow. And everyone that's heard the album has gone, wow, that is fucking amazing. Who played that? But I played the real sitar on that as well. I went out to the echo chamber, plucked the sitar for about half an hour and got in touch with George Harrison's spirit. What's it called? A tambura. I found it in this place in Camden called Rain Man and when I was buying it the lady went you know Noel Gallagher has one of these <laughs> and I was like yes I know when the track finished we kind of left it in the room for about, about a good 12 hours until somebody was doing something it was like what's a fucking noise coming from and somebody forgot to switch it off <laughs> However many recordings you've done in your life that you're not 100% satisfied with, I'm 100% with that one. I just love it. And it's number nine, which is, that'll do me. I love it. I fucking love it. It's rocking, man. We've done it. That should have been on the last one and all. We were recording it then going, this is the first single. But it's never sounded this good though. When I fucking sing it, I still feel fucking mental. Most of the time, Oasis tunes are very uplifting. This album hasn't got too much of that on it. It's a bit more disillusioned and thoughtful. My song's got a bit of a religious theme 
and in some of the other songs too it's uh, there seems to be a lot of the mentions of the light I don't know why I was listening back to the mixes in America and I was thinking everything mentions the light and I was like again the fucking it's a bit of a religious theme going on but definitely biblical and the guy that was doing the cover said you know it's religious Armageddon and I was like wow Whoa, fucking hell, we got into this heavy conversation. And I was like, sat there after 10 minutes going, fucking hell, I only wrote a few fucking songs so I can go on tour and make a few quid. There's only any of this shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm more protective about my songs. I didn't really feel I had to be about this one. Everyone played great on it. Liam's vocal was one take. It's the only time he's ever sung it. One of his best vocals ever, I think. just came up with the guitar riff. I had a sort of idea how the melody was going to go, because it's a pretty simple melody. And then, pretty much the same evening, wrote the lyrics. And the way I recorded it then became the arrangement. The, the way the album turns out, it, it's, you know, in terms of like the basic approach, it fits right in there. I don't think I'm playing on it. That's weird that he's not even on his own tune. Is it? That's your fucking weird you are, man. Yeah, I'm well out there. I played drums on three tracks. Soldier On, Bag It Up, and Waiting For The Rapture. I love playing the drums. I'm a, I'm a fucking really good drummer. Since I was a drum roadie with the In Spirals back in the day, I love it. Um, I, played, I played the drums on all the demos, but I'm not, I haven't got the stamina to do, you know. If I could play drums and play guitar at the same time and fucking sing, fuck me, I'd, I'd get rid of all the jokers. Soldier On. Happy memories of uh, Wheeler End, the studio where we used to do all our demos. We'd do a rehearsal and then me and Liam, or me, Liam and Gem, would be staying in the farmhouse. And then we'd go to the pub and then we'd come back and record two or three demos. We used to call ourselves a scuffle band instead of a skiffle band because we just get tanked up and just write all these mad little fucking dick 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 little things. Other bands use that studio too. So the Coral did an album there. Noel was like, talking to the, the guys after they finished their album saying, oh, how did it go? And they explained how they'd turned the computer on and found a load of Oasis demos and they'd listened to them all and they were going to Noel, that tune, Soldier On, that boss, that tune. Noel was saying, never heard of it. And it went around the whole band. Is there a tune called Soldier On? Everyone was like, no, don't think so. He got Stan, who's the Pro Tools dude, to go in and find it. None of us have any memory of where it came from. <laughs> and so he actually had to prove it to us. We're sitting there going, no, we didn't, that, we didn't play that. And then Liam starts singing and it's like, well, does it sound like Liam? I've wrote tunes like that and we've messed about, haven't we, in, in uh, Wheel Around. But I remember writing it without a doubt. I remember because I wrote it. It feels better than the last one, and bigger and bolder. What do I want people to take from it? I don't know. I've never known. You know, I'm not, I'm not that pretentious to go well. And I just think that people, after listening to it, would really question, you know, their own, their own existence on the part. I don't really, as long as they buy it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and possibly tell one of their other friends to buy it as well. <laughs> Come and see us live and buy a T-shirt. That'll fucking do me. <laughs>